Welcome to episode 11. Let's check out what you can expect this episode. The problem isn't necessarily in the medium. The problem is in a lot of the original technique of how folks just thought, hey, if I just speak for three hours, they'll have learned something. Yeah. That's a big assumption. That was, ah, yeah. You didn't see that, that was, one coming, did that you? Was, that was a transition for sure. Oh, um, actually, that was, I think I snuck that one up on it. You did. I did not see you were going on. I'm not the one who buys into constantly this, like, video has to be only, like, two-minute segments because our new generation can't pay attention to anything longer because of TikTok. Welcome to another installment of the high tech podcast you're, you're joined by will illingworth and Yo, yep i was see i was setting you up to see if you oh, would say something yeah, you know, it was I, great it was and, solid and and, and 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 also my name's josh schwartz um so good? yeah great solid intro we're awesome by we're this episode this. we're pros at this yeah yeah if you've made it this long we're 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 nailing it for sure. We're definitely not recording with like five different recording softwares right now. That's for sure. No, it's just not five software. It's one, two software. Two softwares. Two, I, three, you know, it was four microphones. It was over exaggeration for the point of you know, uh, for for fun. You don't. Do anyway, hey. uh, welcome guys. Another episode of this week of uh, talking about some great tools and uh, good topic today. I feel like uh, applicable one, right? So. Um, I want to talk about, I think, multimedia and lecture recording, right? Or at least like instruction recording. I feel yeah. like sometimes people get testy when I say lecture, um, you know, so uh, just in general, I think like multimedia recording, right? Like that that's, I think, a hot topic right now as well, um, mainly because like, I feel like we've dealt with it a lot in our online experience, like our helping design online courses or technology for that or whatever it may be. Um, but then again, you know, we're in 2021 while we're recording this episode. We're not in the miracle world yet where 2020 is uh, a forgotten pastime, you know, um, if only. If only. Uh, and so I feel like everything that happened last spring and into this year, all of a sudden now all of the education a community um, needed to start recording videos. Uh, our right. uh, our Zoom liaison tells us that we're like we're darn near close to filling our Zoom quota for recorded videos, and really? it's like terabytes, like oh, so gosh. much data. And, and we yeah, just I can't even imagine so much. Yeah, yeah. So like it's it's a big thing, right? Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of, with all of that, um, and Will, maybe you speak to this, I think this would be a good kickoff into our conversation. Um, how do you feel like most faculty and instructors approach multimedia lecture recording? Oh, snap. I mean, let's go back to my time at your institution. We're about three, huh, three years ago. That's optimistic. Oh my gosh. It might, yeah, probably four years ago at this point, maybe five years where we were trying to set up physical lecture capture software and hardware in all classrooms because we wanted to be able to record any class that walked into the room. That was the goal. Well, that time, that, that goal then was literally just like, hey, I want someone to be able to walk in, pull up their PowerPoint, hit record. And that will be a lecture, right? That'll be a video we can keep yeah. and we could use forevermore. Today, you know, we, we've got folks doing that same practice just on zoom walk in do your class click record on zoom but the problem that we know now is that um so much of the content that's shared in a classroom as long as it, as long as the students are there if the students are there and interacting and communicating the big problem is student personal information identifying information can't be shared from course to course for FERPA reasons. So yeah. faculty can't just go and record their lectures all hunky-dory and, and copy and paste for next year, right? If they do not have students interacting and they just give a video lecture, you know, with some notes and, and speak to themselves, sure, you could reuse that. But the second a student is a part of that recording, you have to scrub that video for that kind of student data to make sure you can reuse it again. So we got folks that are stuck in that, that way, but I think even the tool we're gonna look at today, um, Josh, you and I have so many ideas of, of and, and we use so many tools ourselves to create video, instructional videos for yeah. websites, for tools, how-tos, et cetera. Um, 
where you're doing something short form, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes, and you're keeping it for yourself, you're, you're creating it and polishing it before the students ever see it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's more where we want to be. But yeah, I don't I think agree. that's where everybody is. No, and I would, I would say similar stuff that like, now I think our environment's a little bit different um, that we had like those two different types that I would say that often is the way people jump into recorded media. Um, like your point, like, well, I just want to record what happens in the classroom. Okay. Um, and uh, there's, I, I have my own problems with that beyond just like the FERPA considerations. I'm actually kind of glad the FERPA considerations are a thing yeah, um, so good, that we have other pen. grounds to say like, not, because the problem is this, like you're recording an environment that the student's already not a part of. It's one thing if you're recording it because they like missed a class, right? Or you want to provide an alternative to students in that class who couldn't be there. Like in our COVID environment right now where students may get quarantined or they may not be there, that, you right. know, like there's different environments and you and I have, we're in different type of environments as well. Like we've got more of a blended space going on. I know you have more of an online environment happening. Um, and, uh, but, I also saw before COVID people wanted to do like, oh, well, I want to record like my three hour class um, and put the video up. First of all, like, weren't you telling me some of them even were like eight, their eight hour lecture seminars? Well, they were like, yeah, they were like uh, residencies for like a grad course, you know, like, and uh, so like, I think the problem is you're, you're trying to record an environment the students already not a part of. So it's not going to be catered towards the students watching online, which means it's not going to be a good learning experience. It's not right. going to be something they grab things away for because there's there's tons of data to show how people watch videos. Um, and, and I'm not the one who buys into constantly this like video has to be, you know, only like two minute segments because our, our new generation can't pay attention to anything longer because of TikTok. I don't right. buy into that, that uh, piece. I buy into the fact that like watching something online is different than listening to someone live and therefore we can only handle and process so much information at once out of a video that and um yes i do think like good video content online should be shorter not three hours long um not just because people aren't going to pay attention but because they're going to get overwhelmed with the amount of content and they're not going to retain what's in that video uh, the same way they would if they were in a classroom well and let's just keep a thought real, real quick there like I actually work with a couple of faculty who do a lot of long form instruction. Yeah. And when I say that, I mean, some of their videos are 30 and 45 minutes long. One of the things that I, I really try to emphasize with them and their design, because I, I can't stop them. And, and I actually don't think it's necessarily wrong. Like you said, people can sustain attention. People can also hit pause. Like yeah, that's if true. you have an attention need, pause, step away, come back. Um, but the, the point that I try to make with folks who go into the more of the long form design is make sure there's an intended cadence for the instruction. Tell them to watch this 30 minute video, then do something separate, then do an interaction, then do an activity, then read your textbook, and then come back for the next video that's another 30 or 45 minutes. Like telling the students to sit down and watch the three hours of instruction at one time, that's already defeating the, the, the value of the video as a long form format. We want them to maybe take notes while they're watching, to be starting work on a project while they're watching, to be getting instruction while they're watching. And then that 30, even 45 minute video should cue them to go do something else. Recording three hours and saying, watch three hours and then expecting them to learn everything that you said in it has no value, whether it's recorded or done live. And that's one of those things for me that COVID is like, so put the spotlight on. The problem isn't necessarily in the medium. The problem is in a lot of the original technique of how folks just thought, hey, if I teach, if I just speak, excuse me, if I just speak for three hours, they'll have learned something. Yeah, that's a big assumption. And and one of the things you said first that really caught me, Josh, was that in recording the lecture that happens in the classroom and then putting it up on the online and expecting that to be the learning for the, the, the students. The big issue there is that the audience and the goal is not the same from that yeah. online course to that that uh, that physical course, that face to face experience, and isn't that the first thing we tell all of our students about writing papers, about giving speeches, about everything? Right? Choose your audience, know your audience. If I want you to write this research paper, I'm your audience. Write to me. If I want you to write a persuasive paper, I want you to persuade the opposite opinion of you know whatever the topic is. 
yeah. audience analysis is one of the first things we do in instructional design. It's literally the A of Addy. And and anytime I meet with a first fac a member faculty member for the first time, all of my questions are who, how, what, why, should we, shouldn't we? Do you like it? Do you not like it? What do you want to do? What don't you want to do? All those analysis questions that help me understand what the faculty member is trying to do are questions we need to, our faculty and we need to be asking as we're creating video content for students to consume. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think the, the, uh, the one thing I think I would maybe, it's not a pushback in there, but it's a comment that I think I've, at least a conclusion I've come to is that, um, I do think it sits both on not just the medium, but the way that we presented the content, the content originally, if you're bringing that, you know, huge, long three hour content where you just spoke for three hours and live, you're still having problems there. There's still the comment I would say is that I do think in the medium of video, there is the, the problems we get with watching longer content live is heightened uh, in a, in a video medium. Um, because there is something like exhausting about watching video content. And to the point, like I've had instructors make that same argument of like, well, I just tell my students to pause it. Um, here, here's the one thing I will push back on the pause thing. Um, we didn't just talk about this ahead of time, people. Um, is we that, never do. <laughs> um, if we know our students are going to pause that lecture, <laughs> um, why are we creating the lectures in the way that, that would, they would better digest it, right? So, um, okay, you got a 30 minute. So one of the things we encourage, right, is, so we have a tool at our institution. We're gonna be talking about a tool here in this episode, but we have a tool at our institution that we adopted that goes with our LMS Canvas uh, for screen recording and things like that. Um, and we, the tool has its own limitations for how long the recordings can be. Um, so that's part of the factor, but we encourage people, okay, even if you've got like, um, now 30 minutes is, is in that gray area for me. But if like you've an hour lecture, um, like just break it into two parts. Like if they're gonna pause it halfway through, what's the point of doing two full videos? Um, like do, or sorry, what's the point of doing that one long video if they're gonna pause it anyway in the middle? Break it for them already. Cause that's part of your job as the instructor is also to guide the learning that's happening. If you know they're not gonna learn as well by watching that 30 minute video straight through, um, like then why not break it into two parts? You know, why not chunk it out into short 15 minute segments um, that maybe can tie with other activities that you're doing or uh, some type of, you know, follow up or in something in that dynamic. I think that's like where I try to push into that video area is to say like, um, I think what I often get to joke about with our faculty is that like, okay, if I handed you a 30 minute video on something to do, um, are you gonna tell me you're gonna watch that whole 30 minute video? Uh, if your answer is no, then here's a 30 minute video with every step you need to set yeah. up your canvas for the, for yeah. the beginning of the semester. And I get it. You think your content is more engaging than mine. And it's absolutely true. I'll be honest. I would rather listen to some of your guys, con my faculty's content than have to learn about how to set up canvas. Okay. Um, <laughs> but your students are not always going to think that. Um, and so they may, you may say, hey, pause this video halfway through. And they may do that. But what they may say is, oh, man, I really got to get moving. I really just want to get this done. You know what? I'm going to play this video on double speed. And I'm going to piece through this thing. Okay. Um, and uh, they are not retaining what's in that video. And we can be annoyed at them for doing that. It's partially on them. But I think it's also partially on us for not anticipating, like, Our this is how people design. learn yeah. in, in, in a digital space. So we should be designing to leverage the strength of the online and video environment and not just play into its weaknesses and get annoyed at it for be for having those weaknesses. My wife and I get up every day, uh, every work day, excuse me, at 7 a.m. And we do either a yoga video, a Pilates video, or, you know, something else, right? Yeah. Just a and small note for anybody right now listening who feels bad about themselves. Um, I don't get up at seven in the morning and do <sighs> yoga. So I'm right there. <laughs> I'm not trying to like exercise shame people. I know. Here, but I'm try I am trying to make a point. Yeah. So I my know. wife and I are dedicated enough to do that and, and to be pretty darn consistent about it. And we want to be there. We know the benefits to ourselves and we know the goal, the end goal that we have for being more flexible, for being more fit, for what, all that. 
And even so, when the, uh, you know, yoga instructor on YouTube or whatever says, and now you could pause the video if you want to continue doing more reps or hold this position longer or readjust so you're in a better, we don't pause. Like, uh, you know, we're there for the best reason. We are motivated. We are the, we are literally the audience she is trying to reach. This instructor is trying to reach. And yet we, the A plus student, do not pause the video oh, yeah. to go further in depth. I mean, your point is made, Josh. Like, it's, yeah. you know, one of the things we have to think about when we're talking about the design of curriculum is, okay, that audience, why are they motivated to do their they're doing is there a grade involved is there a stake involved is this going to help them with a skill that they need in the course or in their real life like all these kinds of questions are usually answered by no when it comes yeah. down to are they do should they pause it midway through and then do something yeah or you know are they going to be interested enough to do that yeah, yeah so your point is i hear you i i i am okay with longer form and i i I'd encourage folks to maybe set up certain parameters that would help them deliver that but but frankly to be honest I have a couple instructors who have set up like voice over PowerPoint interactions where their lecture is broken down a whole hour into slide by slide instruction. And so one slide gets all the instruction. And when they're done with that slide, they go on to the next slide, right? You okay. follow yeah, me. Yeah, it's not yeah, too yeah, complicated. About. Each slide may only have three to five minutes of content on it. And that's, so it's, Altogether, as a package, it's an hour. But if the students sat, sat there and was like, I want to understand everything about, you know, business to business commerce, that's one slide. And they can sit there and listen to that one slide for two to five minutes. And when they're done, they're done. And that, I think, is a, a really helpful way to think about multimedia and video lectures. Like, if you have more than one topic within your unit of instruction, consider how each of those topics could be their own video yeah, or could be their own specific activity or interaction because the more time your students have to work with each topic and the more time they get to sit down and focus on each individual topic, I think is better because when you put all those topics in, a, in a, an hour long lecture back to back to back, unless there's maybe a procedural or chronological value to it, I don't think that there's the need to force to force them to listen to it at the same time. Uh, if you remember one of our instructors from undergrad, who is a masterful, masterful um, church historian, theologian, I don't know if you're going to remember, you know, I don't know if we even took him as the same or not, but I could listen to that man talk for three hours straight. And I did I on a number of about, occasions, yeah. right? Because he could start in 1563 with some specific theologian in Liechtenstein and take us forwards, you know, to, to 1569, three years worth of time and what the impact on theology and all this stuff. And I'd listen to every second of it, but he wove a narrative and, and everything yeah. that he talked about from 19, from 1563 made sense to 15. 1567 68 69 and there was a yeah. chronological purpose oh, absolutely procedural like if somebody's teaching me how to do something of course i need to know how to turn on the power before i can turn on the switch to activate the drill or whatever so that makes sense but otherwise if it's not procedural chronological if there's not some purpose to why i need to have all this content together chunk it down just just break it down into yeah. little bits it's it's easier for everybody frankly yeah or even there into that example like the uh, I know who you're talking about now. I have enough context. I think I know who you're referencing. Um, I was the same way. Uh, I would listen to him, and I don't think we did actually have him together. I think we had the same classes, but I don't think we ever actually had them at yeah. the exact same time. Um, I was the same way. I could listen to him talk for a while, and that's why you know I push back against the entire. That's a whole nother conversation about lecture versus you know not lecture and stuff like that. We have a friend who uh, is much more invested and has released a bunch of content about that, even in a conference. Um, that we've seen and he does a good job I think at laying out that it's yeah. you know it's not one put, is better uh, than the other but I'm just going to put lecture on our conversation topics yeah. for a future because that's, like that's we, a good we need yeah that's a, that's a whole, that's a whole other topic itself. so I'm not going to go down that direction but I will say this okay um, I could have listened to him forever when we're sitting in person if I watched a three-hour video of him oh, talking the about the exact guy. same content I'm just going to be honest I wouldn't get through the entire video. And the reason for that is, is we have to remember that the environment that they're watching your content in is different than the classroom. The classroom is easier, I think, and geared towards that space. Your person watching that video could be from anywhere to try to watch it on their phone while they're on a oh, train. Yeah. 
um, they could be watching it in their off, like if they're, you know, you're teaching more older adults or people who live out, they could be like Will and I who are in our offices doing stuff like this at home. Um, they could be sitting at a dining room table. They could be whatever. And I'm going to tell you what your video is fighting against. Your video is fighting against whatever other thing they can look up on the internet. It's fighting against whatever's happening around the house. It's fighting against whatever's happening in the dorms at the time. And the reality is, okay, that they're going to get into that video and they could listen to him for forever. But then at some point they're going to get pulled away and if it's not chunked out, I, I'm afraid that what happens is they lose effort trying to remember what happened in that yeah. earlier space or find the right spot because you can pause the video, but then you leave the page. Most of our video software tools don't have like a immediately start me from the exact moment I, I watched it Pick in our classroom. I, you know, like, I mean, YouTube will do that um, in general, but not always depending on how you signed in or what you did. So anyway, um, there's i just think that's to that point now i will take this before we kind of jump out of this conversation to this um a lot of what will and i've been talking about i think are really targeted towards if we're talking about like you're teaching something hybrid or online where you're using a lot of lms content um or you're having to convert a lot of your content um into uh, an online format um but i will say this if you're doing stuff like where you're teaching in a more traditional format and you've got a classroom and stuff like that um, you're, you're probably gonna be doing a little less video recording content in the way we're talking about. Um, and so you might just either be like flipping content for certain reasons online or things like that. And so, um, but I think some of these principles still apply. Don't think like, oh, we're gonna miss class today. I'm, I'm gonna quick record this video of everything we were gonna talk about and throw it online. It's still not gonna work the same way. And, and it's also not gonna be good for you either. It's gonna be a pain to try to record that entire video at a last minute. And so a lot of my encouragement to people who are doing recording video, especially those of you who don't do it as much as just this, um, there's an advantage to chunking out for yourself as well. It's easier to do shorter recordings when you're doing a recording. Um, and uh, don't pressure yourself to get too crazy with all the stuff. Like there's a lot of annotation tools and things you can do. And we didn't really get into that in this episode because there's a lot of ways that that could walk, uh, walk out. But um, like, just try shorter, make sure you have at least just a decent web or a decent mic and a webcam. Um, because a lot can be said about people being able to hear you. There's nothing worse than like crackly voices in the background. We have no idea what it's um, like to have audio issues. Yeah, what well, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and the only other thing I'm throwing out here is you don't need like a magical background. You know, I have like faculty and stuff who will like, you know, lay down like a black sheet behind themselves and stuff like that, and that's great. But like, like even just like a cleaned up background of like, you know, just make sure stuff's not all over the place. Like I, I record videos. And I have like a bookshelf behind me in a classic academic way. Um, I don't put like sheets behind me, you know, or anything like that. So um, just encourage that. And the other thing I would encourage is if I could save my faculty from anything, it would be this. Just test your microphone before you record <laughs> and make time. sure it is on. That's all I have to say. If you take anything away from this podcast, it is that. Turn your darn microphone on and test it, okay? Um, if I had a Wait. dollar for every time somebody recorded a 20-minute video and there was no audio in it because they never double-checked their microphone beforehand, I would be so much richer than what I am <laughs> right now. So that is my recommendation. Just whatever software, tool you're using, whatever you're doing, just make sure it's picking you up. Oh. Do a test recording beforehand. Like yeah. I always do test recordings when I'm doing recordings. We, we did a couple tonight before this episode. Yeah, There's accidentally. They weren't intentional. Yeah, it's fine. It was, it's all about how you tell the story. <laughs> it's test and recording. Josh, like those are really great encouragements because each of those is a little bit of a thread that builds into this bigger story. And I think that the idea behind multimedia lecture, behind video lecture, critical. We have to use it for success right now. And we need to pull on those threads sometimes to kind of weave a tapestry of what it is to have a, an actual classroom experience in the 21st century. Now with that tapestry in mind, it really takes a loom to get us there. <laughs> it's like the best way to weave things together. And um, if we don't need looms of old days anymore, we need looms of the 21st century, don't we, Josh? Oh my gosh, that was... That was ah yeah. You didn't even see that, that was, one coming, did that you? That was that was a transition for sure. Um, I actually was, I think I snuck that one up on him. You did. I did not see you were going that way. Um, and I'm still trying to process uh, how I feel about that transition. Was that? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like you worked hard. 
so I've been I'll thinking about you, it for like five I'll give minutes. You it's solid fine. effort there. Yeah, it's fine. We we are known for our solid transitions of the high tech podcast. Loom is an <laughs> is a is a video creation software, a web based tool. Right, you don't have to download anything. Yeah, no, actually, it's no. not anything that's like super complicated or whatever. It's it's like perfect. Now I have not used it at all. So Josh is going to have to lead this yeah. year and give us I'll take that. I'll take it. So there's a ton of different recording software tools that you could use. And uh, I got onto Loom because I, I can't remember if I found it. I think I found it way back when we were trying to find like a recording software. Uh, like I was just trying to find one. I was new to the space. I was trying to find, we didn't have a screen recording software at the institution at that point, necessarily standard. Like we were using like PowerPoint recording, I think. And that was a whole uh, crap show of whatever happened. Um, some people love it. Some people don't. Um, it's fine. Um, and uh, But then I kind of forgot about it until uh, one of my coworkers, um, I guess they had become free for education over COVID period, started using it again. Um, and because uh, I I'd use some other softwares like Snagit and some other things um, for doing that type of stuff. And I moved to Loom for a couple of reasons. And, and here's why. Um, Loom, as Will said, does not require downloading anything. So it's a purely a web-based tool uh, that you can use. Now, you can download Loom onto your computer and you get access to a little bit more. I think there's more annotation tools um, when uh, you use it on your computer. And to Will's comment, like he doesn't use it at all. I use it right now mainly just to do like quick recordings for faculty on, on things. Uh, we have a larger tool that our institution uses. Um, for actual like lecture recording and content recording. Um, so like that's, I use that more often to do like bigger videos. So I don't often need annotation tools, but there are annotation tools and they're pretty solid. Um, the, the thing I will say that's really easy about Loom is that um, like right now how I use it, I go simply to the, the web page in Loom and I log in. Um, like I have it bookmarked on my browser um, and I just click into it. They do have a Chrome extension. Uh, that you can use with it as well if you use Google Chrome. Um, but it's really easy. Like you just hit record video, you can uh, jump into it. I have it open on my other screen right now. Um, what's really cool is uh, it makes it really easy to drop your webcam in there. They drop like a little webcam circle in the corner. And I will say we have other tools where you can like change the size of your webcam and move it around. Loom doesn't have as many options for that um, because it is a very simplistic uh, recording tool. Like it doesn't have a ton of like after editing tools and stuff like that. Um, but I, I will say this, the reason I like Loom is because it's so simple. Um, like if I could use it on a bigger scale with our institution, I, I would love to because it is so simple. It is simply open it up, hit record, start, it counts it down. Um, and I've recorded tons of videos on it and I've had no problem um, with it uh, running. And it's very, the processing time is pretty quick um, and uh, pretty solid videos. Um, and then what's what I really like about it is there's like, uh, we have a tool that integrates with our learning management system, Canvas, so they can embed things into it, which is great. But what I love about this is it easily takes you to kind of a page where you can click a button and just immediately copy the link to the video and send it to anybody. Ooh, um, nice and easy. Yeah, so it's it's really, it's just very easy. I feel like it's uh, a lot of the bigger tools we use, we use them for reasons. Um, but sometimes with faculty and people, if you're new to this area, you get hung up on things, it's harder to share videos. It's, um, and so if you don't have a solution where you're at, Loom I think is a very easy solution to use, especially in a personal use um, and use inside your courses um, because you can easily put those links. Loom embeds into other sites. So it's, you can easily embed your Loom videos. Um, and uh, they have a good library system for your videos. You can easily title them, create folders to organize your videos. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a pretty sweet tool, um, from my opinion. Now I would say, sorry, looks like you're gonna say something. Well, no, I was just gonna say, do you, you were telling me something about their education plan. Like, yes. Is it pretty. Yeah. So, uh, pricing as far as how the, the tool works. So obviously they have like business and enterprise features and stuff for teams, like teams could use loom together, um, things like that, but they have a free for education plan currently. Um, and uh, what that plan gets you is a lot of the advanced features. Uh, so like for instance, in the free version right now, I think you can record up to a hundred videos and you can only record up to five minutes uh, in length. In the, in the actual free for education plan, you've unlimited videos. Your videos can only go up to 45 minutes in length. Um, they stop you at 45 minutes. 
Um, but you can have unlimited view viewers. Uh, you get a personal library, which I have a personal library uh, in it. And it's very nice. Like I create folders for my videos uh, so I can keep them organized. Um, and uh, you can easily share those videos, search them. It's, it's a pretty uh, good tool. And with that advance, you get like HD video. You can do your screen and camera recordings. You get drawing tools. Uh, and the other thing that I like when you actually download the app, so I don't use this with the, the web version, but with the app, if you download it on your computer, um, they'll automatically throw on what they call uh, like a cursor emphasis. Uh, options you've seen this right you do recordings like our recording tool has it where like if i move my cursor i click you know a little circle will show up around your cursor which is it highlight. seems it seems minor but it's actually really nice when you're doing video recordings um so i like that they have that and the other thing i also really like about this is they have insights on your video um which is important and the other thing <laughs> so i personally love this um i get emails when somebody clicks in and watches my video um, so I use this mainly from like a support piece uh, right now. So uh, <laughs> what, watched what, what I, I love about it is when I get emails from people um, and if I have anybody who knows me and who's gotten a video from me is listening to it. Um, if you email me and you haven't watched my video, I know you haven't watched it um, because Loom doesn't send me a notification. Um, so, but they do that. Viewer insights will tell you like how much they're watching your video, where they fall off. So to what Will and I were talking about earlier, um, you do that longer video, full 45 minute video, you might start to see people fall off in a certain section of the video. So those insights can be important. Um, and then the one last thing I'll throw in there, uh, you can do what's called a call to action uh, using Loom. So Loom gives you the ability like at the end of a video to throw in uh, what they call a call to action, which will basically be like a thing that pops up on the screen with the video. And you can actually say like, go here or do this um, and uh, basically kind of give an action to the end of your video. Um, now it could be in other places in your video too, but um, yeah. So overall, I think it's just, I think it's a solid free tool uh, that you can use in education. I've been using it now pretty solidly for about a year and I've had very few issues with it. Um, now I can't, Will and I are transparent about this when I say this. Um, there are tools we said have been free for education for a long time and tools that have not. <laughs> Loom has not been free for education for a long time. Um, so I can't guarantee one of my cautions with Loom is I can't guarantee that it's going to be free for education yeah. in another year to two. Um, it could just be like a COVID-19 response kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and now we're pretty far beyond that response from the tool and they've kept the plan free. So I think they've been trying to push themselves into education because they are, I'd have to look up their history. That would have required us to research uh, before this. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I don't know how long Loom has actually been around as a company. Um, I know that they're not, they don't have a long history. They're newer. Um, well, and that's the good yeah. thing about uh, just a couple of quick Googles. We can get that kind of information. But yeah, one of the other things I always watch for with these companies, is they, they, they you know, loom that it could have been six other names before it got to this name. So yeah, it can be yeah. a bit of a fun trick to, to track them all down. Absolutely. And that's, I'm not finding a ton of stuff on a quick Google search, but maybe we'll try to throw that in our, in our page for this podcast. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, I think it's just, it's good. And there's a lot of other tools out there that can do them. They all generally, my feedback on a lot of recording tools is they, they ray, they all will do mostly what you want. They just range from what I would consider loom, which is a pretty solid user experience. I think it's a good, simple tool that gets a lot of the complication out of the way for recording. Um, there's going to be other tools that will do more than what loom does, but they're either going to cost more which, you know, is just basically costing something uh, when it compares to Loom. Um, or they're going to have way more features that like somebody like myself who does a lot of video editing and stuff would be fine with. But for the average instructor or somebody like that, you really just want to cut out maybe that beginning part that you did something dumb when you started recording. Like you don't want to do a whole bunch of crazy editing. Or the motorcycle driving by right. Yeah, so it's, it's totally part. unnecessary. Um, and you can easily pause your video and stuff like that um, and cut sections out. Um, so they do have the, that availability. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it sounds like it's solid. A, a great one because one of those things that I work with when trying to help faculty out is, is just ease of use, right? I mean, they want to be able to put up their PowerPoint and start talking and Loom is something that'll let you do that. Um, and, you know, check in with your institution. I, I know actually a couple of faculty members that I've worked with um, at mine don't know that we have a solution. 
we do have yeah, institutional sure. solutions available. So always check in on that with your IT groups or with your instructional design groups, because it'd be great to know you've got something internally. We have one internally that um, it can track everybody to everything. Like, like Josh is saying about tracking if they open the email or how long they, they watched or how much they watched or when they dropped off. Because of our solution setup, it tracks every user. You, know, you can literally look up user ABC123 and you'll see down to the minute what they did and didn't do. Yeah. Loom might not have that much detail of who or what exactly by name. I, I might track that through the link or whatever, but just you know, encouragement, check out your institution, make sure you've got something. Uh, if not, dig into this because I, I'm already ready to go get it myself just for the email yeah. notification thing that Josh has talked about. I do that same thing all the time. Here's the video, <laughs> check this out. And then people do or don't follow through. So one other thing I'll throw out there in this too, even though we're not getting too far into this in this, this episode, I forgot about this. Uh, Loom does give students or people who watch your video the ability to comment in the timeline of the video. Um, so uh, this is something we'll get super into, but uh, basically that means like if your student had a question on a video, uh, they could comment at like minute 21 uh, at the specific moment in the video and you get notifications. Um, now, obviously there's some limitations with that. Uh, for you to really know that that's happening the right way, your students would need accounts in Loom as well. Like, so there's there's those elements. Uh, like perfect, I don't, but it's not good. perfect. I don't use it that way right now. Um, but I will say this, I have it like in an incognito window right now as somebody who like outside my account just to refresh my memory what it looks like. They can leave a comment and type in their name and hit enter. Um, so there are ways around this if you were not using this institutionally. Um, and I could say that has a lot of benefit. Like we have a tool, our tool at the institution that we adopted, we mainly adopted that tool because it does a lot of what like a Loom would do, but it, it's directly built by Canvas. It's called Canvas Studio. Um, and uh, they have that same feature. People can comment in the thread of the video and it's, it's a cool feature. It's nice to be able to have that happen um, and get that, that level of interaction. Well, I think that this is a good sell. I mean, this is one of those ones we don't have much to complain about. Uh, I, you know, it, it's pretty well vetted and it's available. Like Josh is saying, the big risk is potentially it's not going to be free for education forever. It is currently. Enjoy it while you got it. And of course, get a get an account sooner than later. If you got one with your EDU free for now, they might just leave you in grandfathered long term. This week, we dug into multimedia lectures, how to do them, why, what, what's going on with them. And of course, then we've just giving you an opportunity, a tool that you could use to do that. Um, we're going to wrap things up here and not do a cut bumper this time. We're just going to wrap it out and close for the day. So we appreciate you taking a listen with us. We hope that you continue to uh, check up with us week to week as we discuss what it takes to harness technology in the classroom, whether it is physical or virtual. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. See ya.